Welcome to Revelation Bible Study, hosted by St. Paul Lutheran Church and School. I am your host or teacher, whatever you want to call me. I'm Josh Laborious. I'm the vicar here at St. Paul. And this is the video on Revelation chapter 7. And if you have stumbled across this, um, we have the videos all through Revelation hosted on uh, St. Paul's YouTube page. And if you want to get connected with those, I would encourage you subscribe via the link below or at the end of the video there will be one up above my shoulder and there's um, also just a link to the next video in case you would want to watch through these sequentially as we go um, I would encourage you especially do subscribe to that YouTube page because we have all sorts of awesome stuff here on the YouTube channel we have live worship we have this Bible study we have a, another Bible study on the foundations of what it means to be a Christian we have daily devotions. We have all sorts of really awesome stuff, uh, both for you and for kids and for family members of all ages. Um, so all of those shameless plugs, getting them out of the way, throwing them out there right up front. We are stepping into Revelation chapter 7. Um, and if you've been following, if not, I would encourage you maybe go back and watch some of the previous videos to get a little bit more context for this chapter. But this is a continuation of the previous vision that John had to kind of frame where we're coming from and where we're headed. And what's interesting is we're shifting from vision, uh, parts of the vision that deal more with cosmic upheaval to a vision that's more of salvation and salvation for God's people, which, as we've mentioned again and again and again throughout Revelation, that is the whole point of the book, it is God's plan of salvation for his people. And what's what this really functions as, what this chapter functions as, is it's an interlude, it's an intermission, it's a break of comfort in between the opening of the first six seals and the seventh seal that comprise John's first vision. And if you want some more details on, well, seals, what's he talking about seals and seven and all that, watch the video for chapter six. Um, but that's kind of where we're coming from and where we're going. And at this point, I would encourage you to get out your Bibles, whether it looks like this or whether it looks like this, um, and turn to Revelation 7, which is at the end of, I'm just all turned around here, at the end of the Bible. Revelation is the last book in the Bible. And you're going to flip, flip, flip until you get to Revelation 7. And then we are going to read together the first eight verses. It says, After this I saw four angels standing at the four corners of the earth, holding back the four winds of the earth, that no wind might blow on earth or sea or against any tree. Then I saw another angel ascending from the rising of the sun with the seal of the living God. And he had been called with a loud voice to the four angels who had been given power to harm earth and sea, saying, Do not harm the earth or the sea or the trees until we have sealed the servants of our God on their foreheads. And I heard the number sealed, 144,000 sealed from every tribe of the sons of Israel. 12,000 from the tribe of Judah were sealed, 12,000 from the tribe of Reuben, 12,000 from the tribe of Gad, 12,000 from the tribe of Asher, 12,000 from the tribe of Naphtali, 12,000 from the tribe of Manasseh, 12,000 from the tribe of Simeon, 12,000 from the tribe of Levi, 12,000 from the, the tribe of Issachar, 12,000 from the tribe of Zebulun, 12,000 from the tribe of Joseph, and 12,000 from the tribe of Benjamin were sealed. So... As we walk through this, breaking this down, um, explaining and, and applying it a little bit, I want to start at the very beginning. It, it talks about the four corners of the earth. Uh, I shouldn't have to make this clarification, but I'm going to make this clarification. It's not insinuating a flat earth. It's speaking to the four directional corners. It's, it's a poetic way of saying the entire earth. Um, and fun mathematical fact, you can create corners on a sphere mathematically using geodesic lines. So, there. Um, but, anyway, these four angels are standing at the four directional corners of the earth. They're holding back the four winds. Um, which is really cool because if you look back at angels in Jewish literature, they're often referenced as keepers of natural elements. Uh, they're assigned by God. These particular four are actually, they're kind of identified with the four horsemen, which comes a little bit if you look at Zechariah 6, verses 1 through 8. Um, that's kind of what you see there. And sorry, I'm looking over this way, but my 
other Bible is open over here. It says, Again, I lifted my eyes, and behold, four chariots came out from the two mountains. The mountains were mountains of bronze. The first chariot had a red horse. The second had black horses. The third white horses. The fourth dappled horses. All of them strong. If you watched Revelation 6, you'll be like, hey, that sounds a lot like the four horsemen in Revelation 6. Then I answered and said to the angel who talked with me, what are these, Lord? And the angel answered me, these are going out to the four winds of heaven after presenting themselves to the Lord of all the earth. The chariot with the black horses goes to the north country. The white ones go after them. The dappled ones go to the south country. When the strong horses came out, they were impatient to go and patrol the earth. And he said, go patrol the earth. Um, so that is all the way back in Zechariah, one of the prophets kind of making this connection for us of the four horsemen and these four angels at the corners of the earth. And what these these angels are symbolic of, or what they're holding back, the, the winds that they're holding back are symbolic of, is tribulation and suffering under the permissive will of God. And if you want to talk about, well, how does a good God allow suffering? Oh boy, do I have the podcast for you, and it should be appearing in the top corner any second now. A link to the podcast. If you're curious on how God allows suffering, maybe why sometimes God allows and even creates suffering. So, that's kind of what these four winds stand for, is this tribulation, this suffering. And then we see another angel rising from, from the rising of the sun. Uh, this, the sun rises in the east, and what why that's significant is Ezekiel and Malachi, again, two Old Testament prophets, both reference the future glory of God as coming from the east. So this is a, an angel representative of the glory of God. It is a messenger of God, uh, kind of symbolic standing for God's grace, which is protecting his people, which is what we immediately see. He says, don't harm anything until we've sealed the servants of our God. And so we're going to talk a little bit here about the seal of the living God, the seal of our God. Um, this is permission to act under God's authority. That is kind of, in, in old times, if you had the seal of somebody, you, you had permission to act under his authority, um, which I'm going to go on a little bit of a tangent here to something called authorized discourse. And like I may have mentioned before, I've mentioned in other videos, I do do my best to kind of step away from theological language because I don't find it entirely helpful as we try and connect to the scriptures to build our knowledge of the scriptures. I think more frequently than not, it maybe puts another barrier of understanding up. However, occasionally there are theological terminologies that are, that are just profoundly useful and are so much more succinct than explaining what they mean every time. So I'm about to use it. Authorized discourse is kind of a theological term um, and I think just a literature term, but here's the explanation for what that is. Um, authorized discourse is speaking on behalf of someone, not necessarily reading something that someone else wrote verbatim. It's speaking on someone's behalf. So for example, um, uh, an ambassador, say the U.S. ambassador to the U.N., they go to the UN. The president, the, the Congress, the American people, they haven't instructed this ambassador with exactly what they are to say. But the ambassador is familiar with the goals and the agenda and, and everything of the United States and is authorized to speak on behalf of the country. And this comes up frequently in, in terms of the church, in terms of the Christian faith, when we talk about preachers. When we preach, when myself or, or another pastor, uh, or Pastor Steve, Pastor Andrew, when anyone preaches, we are speaking on behalf of God and on the message. And we don't, we're not given a script. Like, I don't come into the office every Monday and have a script from God waiting in my mailbox for me to preach that weekend. That's not how it works. Um, However, we are familiar and we study and we take this really seriously. We study the word to, to get the message and then we communicate it. And it's, it's authorized discourse in that way. Um, 
and the reason that comes up is the seal of the living God kind of speaks to that. They're authorized to work, to speak, to act on behalf of their God. So you ask, what is this seal? What does it look like? Um, some people connect it to baptism, which is not an unfair connection. That's not exactly where, where I think the, the connection is best or it's best understood, but there are some who connect it to baptism. Um, Paul seems to suggest in his letters and his epistles that the seal is, is really just the reality that the Lord knows who belong to him. The Lord knows the people who belong to him. And that's all the seal you need. Uh, we can be certain and, and sure of salvation because it rests on the truth of God's word. So our faith is in the reality that God said, you are saved, you are redeemed, you are adopted into my family. Now, an assurance of that comes in baptism, comes in Holy Communion, but the seal, I think, is even more fundamental than that. It is just the reality that the Lord knows the people that belong to him. Um, However, here there is, we can't ignore the fact that there's some suggestion of a physical seal, which gets us to the sacraments of baptism and communion, which are for our certainty. It gives us something physical to hold on to um, that connects us to our faith in, in a very physical way. That's actually part of the Lutheran definition of a sacrament, which if you're interested in, I'm sure that Pastor Andrew has talked about that. Um, in his videos on the sacraments, and I will do my best to link that up there. Um, so, anyway, so all of this, it, it's saying they're sealed, and they're sealed until we're ready to go forward and suffer for the mission of the church. Um, this sealing here is not a reference to the initial sealing, not to the conversion of certain Christians. It refers to the ongoing work of the Spirit. You see, because God will not permit his people to be lost. God restrains the winds here. That's what we see here until his people are mature enough to handle them. The majority of people believe that this 144,000 number that is then broken down to the 12 tribes of, e of Israel is a symbolic number. There are people out there who say it is literal that only 144,000 people are saved. That is not what the Bible teaches. That if you go through, if you read this in context of the rest of Scripture, that that communicates that this is a symbolic number, um, that it is just a number referring total complete, referring to total completeness. So um, I'm going to take a pretty solid stance on that. One hundred and forty-four thousand is not a literal number; it is a symbolic number. Um, so that's what we have there, and then. We have the 12 tribes of Israel, which are the 12 tribes of Israel. So, we're going to continue walking through the text in the next four verses. We're going to go to Revelation chapter 7, verses 9 through 12. After this, I looked, and behold, a great multitude that no one could number, which is more than 144,000, from every nation, from all tribes and peoples and languages, standing before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed in white robes with palm branches in their hands, and crying out with a loud voice, Salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. And all the angels were standing around the throne and around the elders and the four living creatures, and they fell on their faces before the throne and worshipped God, saying, Amen. Blessing and glory and wisdom and thanksgiving and honor and power and might be to our God forever and ever. Amen. So we have this great multitude that appears here. Um, this is a countless host. It dispels any limitations people try and put on heaven. Like, oh, only so many people are going to be allowed in. Countless host. Cannot be counted. Um, it, this is a very inclusive thing, not to speak to universalism or, or what have you. Um, but it is very inclusive. Those who have faith in Christ are saved. It's There's not just a quota. Um, this is the church triumphant that we're seeing here. Now, what's really cool here is, is in their praise, salvation belongs to our God. Our salvation is not ours. It is a gift from God. And it points to this, this praise points to this salvation as the most important aspect of God's saving work. So that's, that's what we have here. And this reflects on the reality that our faith 
is not something we have done. We, we didn't decide to believe. The Holy Spirit works that faith in us, um, which is just really cool. And it what that does for me is that gives me confidence because I know that I screw up, and I screw up a lot. And there are very few things in my life that I haven't managed to screw up. And even those things that I, that I, at least I think I haven't managed to screw up, I could very easily see myself in the future screwing those things up. But my salvation isn't one of them. My faith isn't one of them. I can't screw that up because it is God working in me. And that that is something to be thankful for. And then it closes this praise. It says, Amen, blessing and glory, etc., etc. This is just a hymn of praise by all the faithful. So even in heaven, we see um, we see God's people praising him for everything he's done, for the salvation that he has given to them. So with that, we'll step into the next five verses of Revelation, starting at verse 13. It says, Then one of the elders addressed me, saying, Who are these clothed in white robes, and from where have they come? I said to him, Sir, you know. And he said to me, These are the ones coming out of the great tribulation. They have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. Therefore they are before the throne of God and serve him day and night in his temple. And he who sits on the throne will shelter them with his presence. They shall hunger no more, neither thirst any more. The sun shall not strike them, nor any scorching heat. For the Lamb in the midst of the throne will be their shepherd. And he will guide them to springs of living water, and God will wipe away every tear from their eye. So it talks, these are ones who have come out of uh, the great tribulation, but it's uh, Christ's sacrifice has made them clean. They have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. Um, tribulation, when it speaks here, they have come out of the great tribulation. This is speaking of tribulation, of struggle, of strife, as a continuing reality for Christians. Um, later in Revelation, there is some, that is a capital great a capital G, great, capital T, tribulation. Um, that's not what this is. The, that is a distinct event. This is the great tribulation of, of the reality of being a Christian in the world. Um, the great tribulation that we normally think of is the time when Satan will be released for a short amount of time. We will discuss that later. If you look forward to the other videos, they get there. Um, and it says that, therefore, they are before the throne of God and serve him day and night. This is our future. This is your future, and this is my future as faithful followers of Christ. There is no suffering of any form. We are worshiping God in person. We are in communion and community and genuine relationship with God. And that is incredible. And then in verse 17, it says, For the Lamb in the midst of the throne will be their shepherd, and he will guide them. Um, which is a phenomenal pas passage to rest in. Um, and to close on. So that's this is kind of the, the nice break we get. We get to see the vision of the, the saints in heaven at peace with God because of the work that Jesus Christ has done for you and for me. So that is what we have here in Revelation 7. I hope this video was helpful. If it was, go ahead and give it a like. Uh, let us know that it was helpful. Subscribe to the channel for all those great things I talked about at the beginning of the video. And uh, Brothers and sisters, go in peace and serve the Lord. Thanks be to God.